All right, welcome everyone to this supplemental video for lab number six. Uh, remember lab number six is looking at the bones of the axial skeleton. This video is gonna cover the bones of the skull. And I've taken some photographs of the skull from several different angles that we'll look at. I will point out the major features from each of these views that you'll need to know. But again, remember, there is no substitute for actually being in the lab and studying with one of the actual skulls. So don't rely just on this video, please. So this view that we're looking at here is an anterior view. We are facing the skull and there are several bones here that you'll need to know as well as several markings. Now, before we begin actually pointing out the things that you need to know, I do wanna talk about something that's important to understand when you're studying these skulls. Depending on which skull you're looking at, you'll either see some of these orange lines, or in some cases, they're yellow lines, or in some of the cases, uh, a couple of our skulls don't have any color to the lines at all, but they are visible if you look closely. These indicate where one bone ends and the next bone starts. The skull itself is not just one bone. There are several bones that make up the skull and these lines, these are called sutures and that's where two or more bones come together. So that's kind of a guide for when you're not real sure which bone you're looking at, it can give you an idea of, okay, well, it's in between this bone and this bone. So let's go ahead and get started and learn some of the features from the anterior view of the skull. First, this bone here, the lower jaw, this is called the mandible. So the lower jaw is the mandible bone. And on the mandible bone from this view, we can see two small holes, one on either side of the chin. Think back to the very first lab of the semester when we were learning surface terminology. Remember the chin region was called the mental region. Well, these holes are called mental foramen. Foramen is really just a word that means hole. So if we learn what some of these words mean, they will help us to figure out what some of the names are. So these holes on the front of the mandible are called the mental foramen. Next, the upper lip and kind of the inside of your jaw region. This area here, this is the maxilla. Now really there is a left and a right maxilla. You don't have to get that specific. This is the maxilla bone. And the maxilla bone is really extensive. We can see that it forms the bone behind your upper lip. We can see that it forms part of your cheekbone. You can't really see, we'll see in a moment when we see another view, but it forms kind of the side of your nose. Later, we will see that it also forms the base of part of your eye sockets, your orbitals. So the maxilla bone. Next, right next to the maxilla bone on either side, we've got the zygomatic bone. Now your zygomatic bone really forms your cheekbones. The zygomatic bone is this large structure right here, which we commonly call the cheekbone. It's also the outside wall of your orbits, your eye sockets. Moving upward, the bridge of the nose, this is called the nasal bone. The nasal bone is the bony part of the bridge of your nose. Going up further, the forehead and part of the top of your head. This should sound familiar. This is the frontal bone. Remember the forehead was the frontal region. Well, this bone is the frontal bone. Now, a couple of other things that we can see from this view, 
right here, all of these kind of folded areas inside the nose, there are a couple of bones that we can see here. The upper part right here, this is a part of the bone called the ethmoid bone. And then on the side of the nose, these are called nasal concha. Now, the top two nasal concha on each side, this one and this one, these are a part of the ethmoid bone. But the bottom two conchas, the one on each side, these are simply the inferior nasal concha bones. So they are not a part of the ethmoid, they are their own bones. And the bottom part, sometimes just we kind of incorrectly refer to it as the nasal septum, but the nasal septum really is connective tissue. Uh, this is the bone that separates the left and the right parts of your nasal cavity, and this is the vomer. So the bottom part is the vomer, the upper part is a part of the ethmoid bone. Looking inside the eye socket, inside the orbital, this large bone that forms the back wall, this is a part of the sphenoid bone. The upper part of the orbital, this is a part of the frontal bone. We can see it is continuous. There's no orange line to separate. And then we've got these holes in the back of the orbital. These holes, since they're long, they're elongated, they're not just simply like poke holes, these elongated holes, we don't call those foramen, we call them fissures. A fissure is essentially a long hole or a long crack. The upper one on each side is called the superior orbital fissure. And the bottom one on each side is called the inferior orbital fissure. Now from this view, that's all that we can see clearly. We're going to look at the skull from several different views and we will see more and more and more bones and more markings. So now in this view, we've got the mandible isolated from the rest of the skull. Remember, this is that lower jawbone, the mandible. And again, we can see one of the mental foramen, but we can see some of the other structures that you need to know in this view also. And the first is this point right here. This is called the coronoid process, and there's one on the other side also. So that brings us to, again, when I said, if you learn what the words mean, it can really help with understanding what their names are. So something we're going to run into a lot is words that end in O-I-D. So when you see O-I-D at the end of a word, that means resembles and it resembles whatever the first part of the word is. So corin or corona. Well, when you think about corona, you've probably heard that word before. So let's see what does corona mean. A lot of you are probably thinking, okay, corona, beer bottles. But there are other places where we hear corona, but the most often that I hear is corona beer. And when you think about Corona beer, if you are familiar with it, what do you think of on the front of that bottle? Well, on the front of the bottle, there is a crown. And when we think about crowns, they usually have these little points at the top. All right. This is why we think about the Corona oid process. This resembles those little peaks on a crown. So the coronoid process. The other part that we need to know on this view is this guy right here. There's one on each side. This is called the mandibular 
condyle. A condyle is different from a process in that both processes and condyles are something that kind of stick out from the bone. Processes tend to come to a point, but condyles tend to be blunt. So this is the mandibular condyle. Coronoid process is more pointy. Mandibular condyle is more blunt. So to wrap this all up, we have the mandible, that's the bone. We have the mental foramen. We have the coronoid process. And we have the mandibular condyle. Back to the whole skull, and we've rotated a little bit. So we're kind of an anterolateral view, not quite face on, not quite directly from the side. We've just rotated a little bit. And a lot of the same structures are still visible. I'll kind of rush through those a little bit. So what we see here is the frontal bone. Here we see the nasal bone. Here again, the top of the eye sockets or the orbitals, that again is the frontal bone. We see the maxilla, but in this view, we can now see that the maxilla goes up and does form quite a bit of the outside uh, of, the, of the nose. And it extends inward, and here we can see what I was talking about earlier. It forms the base of the orbital, the base of the eye socket. Here we can see where it's extending and forming just a little bit of the cheekbone. Down here is the mandible, and we can see that coronoid process and the mandibular condyle. We can see the vomer and the inferior nasal concha bone. We can see a little bit of the ethmoid bone there. Now, some things that we want to talk about in this view, we can see the zygomatic bone a little more clearly, and we can now see that it goes up and forms the side of the eye socket, and it goes back and extends around forming more of that side of your cheekbone. A new bone that we can see from this view is this very thin bone right here. This is called the lacrimal bone. The lacrimal bone forms a portion of the inside wall of your eye socket. And a way to kind of distinguish the lacrimal bone is right at the bottom of it, there's a very small hole. Now, this is your tear duct. A lot of people, when they hear tear duct, they think that's where their tears come from. But that's not true. Your tears are actually formed in some glands that sit at the top of your eye. And as you have tears produced, they wash down over your eye and then they drain away into a small opening, and that opening is your tear duct. And then that opening actually drains into the inside of your nose. So if you've ever noticed, if you're crying a lot or if your eyes are watering a lot, your nose runs, and that's because those tears are draining across your eye into this tear duct, of ultimately into your nose and then running out of your nose. So that's why your nose runs when you cry or when your eyes are watering. Some more things that we can see in this view, we have much better views of that superior orbital fissure and the inferior orbital fissure, forming most of the inside wall of the eye socket. This is the ethmoid bone. Again, remember the ethmoid bone forms some of those nasal concha and the inside of your nose. Well, the ethmoid bone also forms the inside wall of your eye socket. And that's gonna be a trend that we run into is we'll see one bone from several different spots. The outside wall of the eye socket here, that is a part of the sphenoid bone. Specifically, it's something called the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. So now we have a lateral view of the skull. We're looking at the skull directly from the side, and there's quite a bit more that's visible from this angle. A couple of the things that we've already seen, here we have 
the frontal bone, the nasal bone, the maxilla, the zygomatic bone, the mandible, and we can see the mental foramen, the coronoid process. Here we see the mandibular condyle. But now a few new things that we can see. This bone that makes the lower part of the side of the skull, this is called the temporal bone. And there's one on each side. And a few markings that are on the temporal bone. Here, this kind of lump that sticks down. This is what you feel right below and behind your ear. This is called the mastoid process. So let's think about what that means. Mast, think about if you've ever heard the word mastectomy, or uh, that's another name for breast removal surgery. Mast, M-A-S-T, means breast. So oid, remember, means resembles. So the kind of rounded size, uh, shape to this structure gives it the resemblance of a breast. So it's called the mastoid process. Also, coming off of the temporal bone, we see this structure right here. This is called the zygomatic process because it reaches forward, ultimately connecting to the zygomatic bone. Now, the zygomatic process meets with the zygomatic bone in this kind of arching structure right here. So this whole thing is called the zygomatic arch. The zygomatic arch is both the end of the zygomatic bone and the zygomatic process from the temporal bone. We also see from this angle a part of the sphenoid bone. This is also the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. The big bone that really forms most of the top and side of the head. This is called the parietal bone. And you have a left and a right parietal bone. So now let's look at some of these larger sutures because they have names. And you don't have to know the names of all the sutures, but some of the larger ones you do need to know. And the suture that separates the frontal bone from the two parietal bones. So this suture right here, it goes right across the crown of your head. So think crown. This is the coronal suture. Coronal crown because it goes across the crown of your head. Next we can see a little bit right here. If you look at the skull directly from above, this is the suture that separates the left and the right parietal bones. It goes right down the middle of the head, dividing the skull into left and right, or right, dividing the left and the right parietal bones. So that is the sagittal suture. Remember, sagittal divides you into left and right. Down here, this suture that separates the parietal bone and the temporal bone, this is the squamous suture. Think back to squamous when we were looking at tissues. The cells were very flat. Well, this is kind of a very flat, straight suture right here. So we can tie those words together, and that is the squamous suture. One last thing that I'll point out, um, well, two last things. One, we can see a little bit of the bone that forms the lower back portion of the skull. We'll see it better in just a little bit. But this is the occipital bone. Remember the back of the head was the occipital region? So this is the occipital bone. And lastly, there's a very small point that comes down right here. We'll see it better from the underside. But this little thing right here that sticks down, that is called the styloid process. So oid, it resembles something. Style or stylus, 
Think about what a stylus is. A lot of us have them on our smartphones or tablets. Well, stylus, that's what they used to write with when they used feather pens. That was a stylus. And this resembled that. It's very thin, very pointy. So that is the styloid process. Now we're looking at the inferior view of the skull. We're looking at the skull from underneath, and there's really a lot going on in this view. And this view really is one of the main reasons why I say you should come into lab and actually spend time with these skulls because it's really hard to see some of the things that you need to know just through photographs. So let's see what we're looking at here. When we're looking at the skull from this view, most of the roof of your mouth, this is still part of that maxilla bone that we learned earlier. So the maxilla bone we saw formed uh, much of the face. It was the upper lip area. It formed part of your eye socket, part of the side of your nose. But now we see here, it also forms most of the roof of your mouth. And just behind it, we have a very small bone right here. This is called the palatine bone. That also forms the rear portion of the roof of your mouth. Both the maxilla and the palatine bone together form your hard palate. Here on either side, we can see a little bit of the zygomatic bone. We can see that uh, zygomatic arch, the zygomatic process. We can see the temporal bone, which makes a lot of the side view of the skull right here. On the temporal bone, we can see a few features. We can see that mastoid process on either side. We can see the styloid process. It's a little hard from this view, but there's the styloid process on each side. Now, some other things that we can see from this view, this area right here, this area right here, and this very small connection between the two sides, this is part of the sphenoid bone. We'll see the sphenoid bone from just about every single angle. So here from beneath, from the inferior view, this is the sphenoid bone. Right here, that dividing line again, remember this is the vomer. Most of the bottom of the skull here, this is the occipital bone. Remember the occipital back of the head, but it's also much of the inferior part of the skull. The really big obvious feature this large hole right here. This is called the magnum foramen or the foramen magnum. Magnum just means large. And again, foramen meant hole. So the large hole, this is where your spine leaves your skull. Remember, your spine really is just an extension of your brain. This is how it actually exits the skull. Some harder to see features that we need to learn right here and here. These are called the carotid canals. Now the carotid artery is what brings blood to your brain. The carotid canals are how those blood vessels get up to your brain. Now on our skulls, on the models, these do not go all the way through. And that's because there's some weird anatomy that goes on. It actually has a very sharp bend up inside, and it's hard to do that on the skull models. If this were a real skull, it would go upward and bend and connect to the inside of the skull. Just behind that, or just below that on this view, and it's hard to see right here, there's this almost J-shaped uh, hole there. It's kind of almost like a fish hook. I, I like to say J-shaped because it helps me remember what it's called. Uh, this J-shaped opening right here, this is the jugular foramen. And there's one on each side, and it sits right behind the carotid canal. Well, the jugular foramen, 
That's how your jugular veins, the veins that drain blood away from your vein and from your brain, that's how they get out of the skull through these jugular foramen. These large kind of swollen areas right here, these are the occipital condyles. And the occipital condyles are what sit on your first vertebrae in your neck. We can't really see it in this view, but there's a very small hole on each side of the uh, foramen magnum. And those very small holes are called the hypoglossal canals. The hypoglossal canals let one of your cranial nerves out of your skull. So here it's still looking at the uh, inferior, the underneath part of the skull, but I took it from kind of a side angle so that you could see some of those features that I was just talking about. Um, just to kind of orient you, here's the teeth of the upper jaw. This area right here is that zygomatic arch. This is the temporal bone. Here's that foramen magnum. Here is the styloid process and the other styloid process sticking up. You can just see a little bit of one of those hypoglossal canals that I was talking about. Here is the mastoid process. Now something that you can see here a little bit better, I didn't point it out in the previous picture, there's this dip right here. I kind of tell my students in person, it looks like somebody maybe pushed their thumb into some wet clay or something. There's just this little bit of a dip. Well, this is how your mandible actually is articulating with or forming a joint with the rest of your skull. That mandibular condyle that we learned earlier fits into this dip right here. This is called the mandibular fossa. A fossa is an indentation, and not always, but often, a condyle will fit into a fossa. So here, the mandibular condyle fits into this, the mandibular fossa. We can see this opening right here. This is actually the external opening for the ear. And this actually has several names, all of which work. It can be called the external auditory canal, the external auditory meatus, the external acoustic canal, or the external acoustic meatus. All of those actually are the same thing, and that's this hole right here. And now the last view of the skull, what we've done is we've taken the top portion of the skull off the skull cap. We've removed that and we are now looking down into the skull from above. We're actually looking at the skull. Imagine the skull is facing the top of your screen. So even though we can't see them, the eyes are right here and right here, so he is facing the top of the screen. Back here at the bottom of the screen, this is that occipital bone, so this is the back of the skull. So what is it that we're seeing here? Beginning at the top, this area right here is the frontal bone. This kind of roughly triangle or oval shaped bone right here is the ethmoid bone. Remember we see that from several different views. This is the ethmoid bone. And there's two different parts to the ethmoid bone that we need to know. There's kind of a flat area and a raised area. The flat area is called the cribriform plate. The cribriform plate. And the raised area is called the Crista galley.
That literally translates into rooster's comb or cock's comb, because if you think about a rooster, that uh, red thing on the top of their head that sticks up almost like a mohawk, that's what this resembles. So that's what they call it. They call it the uh, Krista galley. Now, just beneath that, this area right here kind of looks like a, a butterfly. This is the sphenoid bone. And there's two different parts. It's a little hard to tell from this picture right here. This part right in this area is raised. And this part right here in this area is much lower. The higher part, this part right here, this is called the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And down here, this is that greater wing that we kept seeing either in the eye socket or around the temples. So lesser wing up at the top, greater wing down at the bottom. In between them, and it's hard to see again in this picture, this area right here is very sunken in. This is actually where your pituitary gland from your brain sits. This pituitary gland sits in this little saddle. This is called the cella tersica. The cella tersica. That literally translates into Turkish saddle because of its shape. But this is the cella tersica. Here we see the parietal bones. And again in the back, the occipital bone. Some markings that we can see from this view, again here is that large foramen magnum or magnum foramen. On either side, we can now see the internal openings for those hypoglossal canals. Here are those J-shaped jugular foramen, but now from the inside. This opening right here and over here on this side, we can just barely make it out. This is that internal opening for where your uh, auditory nerves come in. These are called the, again, they have multiple names, internal auditory meatus, internal auditory canal, internal acoustic meatus, internal acoustic canal. Those all four mean the same thing, and they are these openings right here. Okay, I believe that's everything. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up the video here. Please make sure to come into lab. Please make sure to get your hands on these skulls and spend a lot of time with them. There's going to be a lot of information on these skulls on the exam, so you want to know them really well. I will try to do another video uh, over some of the other bones, so keep an eye out for that.